Do you ever find yourself using the phrase, are you serious? It's typically said in response to hearing or seeing something that is unbelievable. And right now we, again, are, are firmly into fall. All right, thank you, Jesus. This is my favorite season of the year. And fall means uh, that the holidays are close. Christmas is not too far away. In fact, if you go into stores, Christmas stuff is already out. You can already buy decorations. Maybe you've already got your Christmas tree up. I don't know. But one of my favorite parts of this time of year as we get closer to Christmas is Christmas movies. And one of the most famous Christmas movies that has a great Are You Serious moment in it is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. And in this movie, they're, they're sitting around the table for Christmas dinner and Clark Griswold, the main character who's played by Chevy Chase, as they're sitting there eating, he mentions that he heard a pilot uh, flying over New York spotted Santa Claus. He's saying this to try to excite the kids. It's Christmas Eve night. But his adult cousin, Eddie, who's visiting, and is kind of the source of a lot of the craziness of that movie, with his family, <laughs> finds it necessary to respond to this claim uh, from Clark to say, are, are you serious, Clark? Meaning, like, are you, are you serious? Santa is coming, right? He, he doesn't kind of get what's going on there. But maybe you find yourself using this phrase when you want to add some weight to a statement. Like, you say, I'm, I'm serious. Like, with my kids, if you don't clean your room, I'm going to take away your tablet. I'm serious, meaning take me seriously. Or for you gluttons of punishment in the sports world, the Mariners have a chance of making the playoffs. I'm serious this time. Or a variation of this that my daughter uses quite often. She says, or else. Okay, give me that back, or else. Listen to what I'm saying, or else. Meaning you better take what I'm saying seriously. We use variations of I'm serious when we feel like something can't be trusted or it isn't getting the weight it deserves. Have you ever had this kind of response when reading the Bible? Because if we're being honest, there are some things in Scripture that can leave you thinking, are you serious? You serious, Clark, right? Let's even just focus in on Jesus. There, there are things he said that are unexpected, unbelievable within the way that we normally see things. And I know I've mentioned this before, but the gospel message itself is a paradox, meaning it's full of statements that appear to be contradictory, but are actually true. Things that leave you saying, are you serious? And just a few examples of things that Jesus said. If you, find your, if you want to find your life, you must what? Lose it. Like what? If you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of God, then what? You must be a servant. Right? You serious, Clark? <laughs> Love your enemies. Pray for those who what? Persecute you. Right? It's unbelievable. It feels unbelievable. The gospel is full of paradox. There's much that Jesus said that can leave you thinking, are you serious? But what if Jesus is serious? What if he was serious? What if he really meant for us to live out the things he said? And today we're starting a brand new series called, What If Jesus Was Serious? And though there's a lot we could cover on this topic, we're just going to take the next nine weeks to look at eight statements Jesus made right towards the beginning of the gospel account of Matthew that can radically change the way I believe we read the rest of the New Testament. And if I could sum up this message in a big idea, it would be this. Jesus calls us to take his word seriously. Jesus calls us to take his word seriously. The portion of Jesus' teaching that we're going to focus on comes from a very famous section of Scripture known as the Sermon on the Mount. And this sermon covers Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, which would be a really long sermon. And whether Jesus actually gave one long message or the author Matthew compiled, in a sense, the greatest hits from Jesus' teaching, we don't know. But we're going to focus on just the first 12 verses, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 12 which probably is, is titled in your Bible, the Beatitudes or, or the Good News List, something like that. And today we're not going to dig too much into that list. We're just going to simply sort of set the stage for what we're going to cover for the, for the remainder of this series over the next multiple weeks. And there is so much that Jesus shares in these nine statements of blessing, which are full of paradox, full of are you serious moments. So let's start by reading the passage as a whole. And just a heads up, I'm going to be reading from a different translation during this series. It's 
the New Testament for everyone, and it's the work of N.T. Wright, who is a leading Bible scholar. So let's start reading in Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the hillside and sat down. His disciples came to him. He took a deep breath and began his teaching. Blessings on the poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven is yours. Blessings on the mourners. You're going to be comforted. Blessings on the meek. You're going to inherit the earth. Blessings on people who hunger and thirst for God's justice. You're going to be satisfied. Blessings on the merciful. You'll receive mercy yourselves. Blessings on the pure in heart. You will see God. Blessings on the peacemakers. You'll be called God's children. Blessings on people who are persecuted because of God's way. The kingdom of heaven belongs to you. Blessings on you when people slander you and persecute you and say all kinds of wicked things about you falsely because of me. Celebrate and rejoice. There's a great reward for you in heaven. That's how they persecuted the prophets who went before you. Blessings on. Okay, we see a repetition here. And that is on purpose. These are a meant to be a short, succinct, kind of memorable list or series of blessings. But before we get too far into that, let's pause and, and discuss sort of the context of what's going on in this section of Scripture. When we look at Scripture, it's important to locate a verse within the bigger story around it. Right? You can't just pick and pull a single verse. You'll, you're missing a ton of what's going on. And so in Matthew 5, verse 1, right, it begins with noting that Jesus saw the crowds. Okay, who are these people and where did they come from? Well, if we back up a few verses into Matthew 4, we get a picture of who Jesus would have been speaking to. So let's read Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 through 25. He, meaning Jesus, went on through the whole of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom healing every disease, every illness among the people. Word spread about word about him went through, around the whole of Syria. They brought to him all the people tormented with various kinds of diseases and ailments, demon-possessed people, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee, the ten towns, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. So we see this vast crowd of, of all sorts of people, right? Some who believed, including, including Jesus' first disciples, and others who were curious, right? Who was this teacher? This guy, that, this rabbi going around proclaiming the, the kingdom of God, this sort of future promise for the, for the Israelites was near. And at the same time, backing that up by healing many inflicted with diseases and even those possessed by demons. So the Sermon on the Mount begins with Jesus sort of seeing this crowd of, of people that are following him, that are, that are sort of, you know, being drawn to him. And he ascends a hillside to sit down and teach. And I've got a couple pictures here from my trip to Israel in 2019. And we went to uh, the place that tradition tells is, is, is the hillside or that area where Jesus would have taught uh, the Sermon on the Mount or taught some of these things. And whether this is the exact place where Jesus went to teach, we, we don't know. But this setting was meant to convey something important about what Jesus was doing. Okay, The fact that he went and sat down on a hillside is a cue to, to, the, to the reader of what is about to happen. Because rabbis would often take the posture of sitting when they were going to teach. It was a signal that something important was about to be shared. So you think of any higher education institute today that the head of each department, the science department, the English department, whatever, is called the chair, signifying the seat of knowledge, one who has authority to teach. That's what we see here. Jesus is sitting down. Rabbi is sitting down. He's going to teach. And so what is he going to share? Well, there's another huge clue just in verse 1. And in Matthew, the author here is tying Jesus in this moment to the first great leader and prophet for the people of Israel. Moses, okay, he was doing this purposefully. Because as we look at Moses in the book of Exodus, he also ascended a mountain, Mount Sinai, and from there taught the people of God. And in fact, if we were to go further into the Sermon on the Mount beyond just the Beatitudes, uh, there are other sections that kind of make this connection more clearly. You know, Jesus is presented as the better and final authority on God's law. 
thereby, thereby sort of functioning as a new and final Moses who gave uh, the original people of Israel uh, the law. But Moses was not only just a lawgiver, right? In the book of Exodus, we, we read about how he helped lead the people out of slavery in Egypt. He was also their redeemer, their deliverer, a savior. And that's a role that Jesus, right, took on for all of humanity. This means that Jesus is not just merely, merely being presented as another Moses. Rather, in line with but greater than Moses, Jesus is being presented here as the Messiah who fulfills God's ancient and promised uh, purposes. So he's, he's completing Israel's story. That's sort of the heart of the story of the gospel. The gospel is the completion of Israel's story in the story of Jesus. And right here from the get-go, in the first verses of the Sermon on the Mount, we are sort of ushered into this gospel reality that, that Israel's law, their moral vision for, for how life should be, the good life, has now come to completion in Jesus' moral vision, what he shares here. So the writer Matthew was cueing his audience into this connection. And all of this is important context because what Jesus is going to teach is worth taking seriously. He's, he's starting something new. He's initiating something new here. And as we go throughout this series, we will encounter one word, I guarantee it, in every message. It's the word blessed or blessed. It's, it's tomato, tomato, however you want to say that. That's where this passage gets the title beatitude or supreme blessing from. So it's, it's important that we unpack that word a bit because we all bring assumptions and meanings to bless that word. And if you look on social media, hashtag, hashtag blessed is something you're going to see a lot. In fact, if you search hashtag blessed on Instagram, you're going to find hundreds of millions of posts. And that hashtag highlights pictures of beautiful places, toned bodies, new babies, graduations, successes, and abundance. And scrolling down, you'll see recent business startups, wonderful technology, new marriages, and fancy cars. But is, is that what Jesus had in mind when he describes blessed? Is that really what he's talking about here? And I have this illustration that describes this hashtag blessed conundrum well. It's actually from a book called What If Jesus Was Serious by Sky Jathani. I would encourage you. It's a great book to read. But when you look at the world, the sign of blessing leads towards those on the left. Those who are powerful, rich, popular, put together. But as we talk about the paradox of the gospel, Jesus provides us with a very surprising list of those who are hashtag blessed in the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Depends on how you want to say that. Right? He says the overlooked, the peaceful, the pure, the meek, the sad, the poor. Right? That runs very counter to culture both in Jesus' day and for us today. None of us would look at those who are meek or sad or poor or persecuted and say, man, they are really blessed. Which is probably why and when, you, when you read that list... Uh, of statements that each have an exclamation because it just it, it ramps up the irony of like how in the world can that mean blessed how in the world does that describe someone who's blessed so what exactly does jesus mean when he says blessed are blessed are well that greek word there for blessing or bless is makarios which means happy blissful fortunate or flourishing it's a it's a direct translation of the hebrew word ashrei which means fortunate. And what makes translating this to English difficult is there's like no one word that encompasses makarios. In fact, if you look in different Bible translations, some of, the, some of them use the word blessed, but you also see other translations that use the word happy or even congratulations. You get a whole kind of mixed bag of, of ways that that is translated. Blessed is a, a misleading translation of makarios because it, it signifies, right, this one whom... God blesses, and that's not necessarily what we see here. Rather, makarios or ashray, it introduces someone who is to be congratulated, someone whose place in life is an enviable one. So the Beatitudes are statements that ascribe happiness or flourishing to a particular person or state. It's more descriptive of who is blessed, which is why each statement of blessing has a promise tied to it, because this isn't an obvious list of those who are experiencing the blessed life. 
The unexpected claim of flourishing found in each verse needs an explanation or it makes no sense. Again, probably why it has an exclamation point. It's trying to ramp up the irony. So what, so what are we supposed to do with these Beatitudes? How are we supposed to read these statements of blessing from Jesus? And the temptation is when we come across a list like this in Scripture, is to sort of see it as a to-do list. This is a to-do list of things I need to do in order to be blessed by Jesus, right? If I want to be blessed, here's what I need to do. It's almost like a vending machine view of God. If I put in the right things, out will come what I want. So if I want to be blessed, if I want to inherit the good life, then here's what I've got. Okay, I've got to be poor in spirit. Now, what that is, I'm not sure, but I've got a few dollars in my bank account. Okay, does that does that count? Am I close? Okay, I've got to check. Let's check that one off. Okay, I've got to be sad. Okay, how do I do that? I mean, I can probably can figure that out. There's a lot of bad things happening in the world. Okay, check. I can do that. Okay, be meek. Wow, okay. Jesus wants me to be meek. I've always heard that meek is weak. So I'm not sure, but I'll figure that out. Okay, check. And so on and so forth. And we can come to Jesus like the rich young ruler in Matthew 19 who asked the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's essentially, what must I do to be blessed? To inherit God's kingdom. The beginning of the Sermon on the Mount is not a to-do list. Okay, as we said earlier, it's a good news list. Jesus is describing who has the most to gain by the arrival of his kingdom. He's not prescribing, not a doctor prescribing what you must do to enter it. And I think of Eugene Peterson's words about how the Bible sort of instructs readers overall. I think it applies well to uh, the Beatitudes. And Eugene Peterson is a well-known author, pastor, uh, wrote the, the message translation as well. But here's what he had to say. Scripture does not present us with a moral code and tell us live up to this. Nor does it set out a system of doctrine and say, think like this and you will live well. Rather, the biblical, biblical way is to tell a story. And in the telling, invite, live into this. This is what it looks like to be human in the God-made, God-ruled world. This is what is involved with in becoming and maturing as a human being. So as we walk through this series, my hope and prayer is that we would have aha moments in these verses. Moments where we glimpse the heart of God for humanity. Where we gain a new understanding, just like we saw in this quote from Eugene Peterson, what it, what it looks like to be truly human and, and live in God's new kingdom world. To live in his way for his purposes. Where we grab a hold of the good life that Jesus has promised for his people. In a world that pursues such life. Hashtag blessed in all of the wrong places. So to help us get the most out of this series, here are a couple things I want to challenge us to do. First is pretty simple. Be in home church every week. You're not going to want to miss any of these Beatitudes. I promise you, you're not going to want to miss any of these. And the second one is this, is memorize Matthew 5, 3 through 12. Memorize that list, uh, that's those eight statements, those Beatitude statements. And don't worry, we're not going to do it all at once. We're going to kind of take this in chunks. So we'll, we'll kind of memorize the verse for the next Beatitude uh, that we're going to look at. And along with memorizing, the third thing with that, I'll invite the Holy Spirit to bring Jesus' words to life. If he is serious, if these Beatitudes are describing what the hashtag blessed life looks like in the kingdom of God, how do I, how do you live into this? And as we wrap up this message, uh, I just want to give us a few next steps in particular for this message. And the first is become a follower of Jesus. Maybe you've been curious about what Jesus is all about. Maybe you found yourself at times saying, is Jesus really serious? Did he really do what the Bible claims he did? <laughs> I would encourage you to let him into that conversation. If Jesus really is who he says he is, if the kingdom of God has come and brought about a radically new vision of the blessed life, right? This, this blessed life that can happen in the midst of sadness, suffering, and poverty, then maybe that's something you should look into. It starts with giving Jesus access to your whole heart and inviting him to make you he came to give you life and life to the fullest. And that goes beyond just the here and now, but into eternity. If that's you, would you let someone in your home church know? We would love to pray with you and walk alongside of you. And another next step 
is this, as we've already talked about. Memorize Matthew 5, verse 3. I'll read this for you again. Blessings on the poor in spirit. The kingdom of heaven is yours. I would encourage you to take time to memorize that verse this week. It doesn't have to be in that translation. It can be in everyone, whatever one you're comfortable with. But memorize that and marinate on it. Allow the Holy Spirit to begin to bring that verse to life. To speak that in and, and to make that help that go deep down into your heart. And the third thing is this, and kind of in reflection of this series, would you take Jesus seriously? Are there areas where you have not taken Jesus seriously? Ways you've kept from truly uh, uh, following what he has called you to. I think again of that rich young ruler that I mentioned earlier, right? He walked away from Jesus because he refused to take his words seriously. Don't do the same. As Jesus speaks, as we read his word, would you choose to listen and obey? This is Jesus called us to in the gospel account of John, chapter 14, verse 15. He says, if you love me, obey my commandments. Let's be those who hear Jesus and take him at his word. Let's choose to listen and love him in obedience. I'm believing for great things as we walk through this series. Would we either discover this good news list or maybe rediscover it again? God bless Oasis.